We just don't love the acts that they participate in. Amen? Amen. Amen. Good afternoon. I am uh, Bishop-elect Tony Mace. I stand with you to break spiritual bread. Welcome to Touched by the Word Ministries Apostolic Center. If we have any first-time guests, we honor you and we thank you for coming out with us tonight. We know that uh, this is by divine appointment and that you did not come here in vain. You passed too many churches. Amen? Amen. So welcome to our hybrid service. Uh, let's go ahead and do our declaration of faith. Uh, there's a word from the Lord this evening. Repeat these words after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I'm a believer and not a doubter. I'm a doer and not just a hearer. And my life is the better. Having heard the word of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Some of you all, the way you said it, I'm not convinced. Go to Romans chapter 8. I'm not convinced. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Amen. Romans chapter 8, I'm going to be reading from the Amplified Version. We're going to begin reading at verse 5. And when you're there, say amen. Amen. It reads like this. For those who are... For those who are according to the flesh in our control in our control by its unholy desires, set their minds on and pursue those things which gratify the flesh. But those who are according to the spirit and are controlled by the desire of the spirit, set their minds on and seek those things which gratify the Holy Spirit. Now the mind of the flesh, which is sense and reason again without the Holy Spirit, is a death, it's death. Death that compromises, that comprises all the miseries arising from sin, both here and hereafter. But the mind of the Holy Spirit is life and soul, peace, both now and forever. That is because of the mind of the flesh, with its carnal thoughts and purposes, is hostile to God. For it does not submit itself to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. So then those who are living the life of the flesh, catering to the appetites and impulses of their carnal nature, cannot please or satisfy God or be acceptable to him. Amen? And then let's go over to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 <laughs> Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. I have one more scripture, but I'm going to use that in my uh, presentation. Uh, we're going to pray. Uh, but tonight I'm teaching on this subject. Uh, I'm going to sign to teach on this subject, fortifying your mind. Fortifying, amen, your mind. Father, we come before you right in the name of Jesus. Lord, we honor you. Uh, we thank you for this assembly here, Lord God. Uh, God, I pray that you uh, perfect everything that's concerning them. Lord, of and within myself, I'm incapable, I'm inadequate. Uh, I come before you, Lord God, and pray that you would anoint this vessel of clay, and that you would anoint these lips of clay, that I will only speak that which edifies, that which encourages, and that which builds up your people, Lord God. Father God, your people need to be encouraged tonight. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, Lord God, that this word would be an encouraging word, that it would be a strengthen, strengthening word and a word that fortifies their mind. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Um, every human has a head that sits on top of their body, and the head is, is very important. Amen. Um, you would not play tackle football without a helmet. You would not, amen, go into a burning, a firefighter would not go into a burning building without having a helmet and protection to protect their head. Amen. Soldiers do not go into warfare or into any type of serious training without having a helmet on their head. The head must be protected at all costs. Amen. Likewise, so is the mind. If the mind suffers any type of trauma, the impact on an individual's life can be major. Amen. It can be major. The mind must be protected at all costs. God created the mind 
with incredible capacity and capability. Amen. But if the mind is altered in any way, the individual's entire life may be changed forever. Amen. It is no wonder that Satan's attempt everything to alter our mind. And so tonight we want to learn about how to gird up our mind, how to strengthen our mind, how to have a resolve. In this day and age right here, you cannot be weak. You cannot be weak. When I tell you the attacks are coming against the body of Christ repeatedly and repeatedly, and you have to take a stand. You're either going to compromise or you're going to stand on the word of God. You cannot stand on the word of God if you're not in the word of God. Go with me to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. I just want to teach tonight. I'm praying for that anointing that makes teaching and easy, preaching and easy, preaching and teaching easy. Amen? So in Romans chapter 7, verse 23, verse 23, he said, But I discern in my bodily members, in the sensitive appetites and wills of the flesh, a different law, rule of action, and war against the law of my mind and my reason in making me a prisoner to the law of sin that dwells in my bodily organs and the sensitive appetites and wills of the flesh. Paul, when you, if you've ever read the, the, uh, the seventh chapter of, of Romans and did any, any, just any type of meditation on it, Paul presents a dichotomy. He, convinced, he, he, he presents a, an individual who's confused. Paul says things like, he said, that what I want to do, I don't do. But that which I don't want to do, I do. And if you're not careful, if you haven't studied it, amen, you would think Paul is schizophrenic. But what Paul is describing is the, 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 the nature of the sin, the sin nature and, 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 and what sin does to us. Many of us, we want to do the right thing, but we find ourselves doing the wrong. Many of us, we want to do, amen, uh, 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 that which is right, but we wind up doing wrong. Some of us, we want to do wrong, but we do right, amen. And what Paul is saying here, he said, it's a war going on in my spirit, but it starts in our mind. It starts in our minds, amen. And tonight, we got to learn how to fortify our minds. Young people, allow me to give you some critical advice. Don't be too inquisitive before your mind is fully developed. Amen? Amen. When we were little, we, we wanted to grow up fast, and we wanted to stay up late as if staying up late was a big thing. And then when we got to the age when we could uh, uh, stay up late, we found out it wasn't all that. I can remember as a young kid stealing into the club and doing things of that nature. Then when I got of age and I could go to the club legally, I found out it wasn't all that. And what I did, I wished and wanted things faster than my mind could comprehend. Amen. If I would just have waited for the proper time when I was mature, I could have handled things in a different way. And in this day and age, you got to be careful because you don't want to order a you don't want to open up a portal to your mind, young people. You don't want to order. You want to put your eyes on things, amen. And you may not be mature to handle it, amen. And so when you open up that portal, you open up a, a portal into the spirit realm of perversion, drug addiction, alcoholism, amen, uh, schizophrenia, amen, amen. Even now, uh, they're playing, you know, your, your peers are playing tricks on each other, and they have these different challenges on TikTok. And, and kids are losing their lives because they're, they, they're, they're performing these dangerous uh, 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 tricks and challenges on, on TikTok. Come on, young people, you're better than that. Amen. You're better than that. Amen. Don't look on TikTok and accept a challenge and put something, put your life in jeopardy or, or, or put yourself in, in a position where you'll, you'll light your body on fire, or do something crazy, and you'll be scarred for the rest of your life. Are right, you listening to what I'm saying? The benefit of maintaining, uh, let me finish it up. He said, in, in other words, uh, don't be too inquisitive before your mind is fully developed. Don't explore things that are reserved for a later time in your life. Don't explore sex before time. You will open up a portal, young ladies, amen, or young men, and you may create a situation where uh, uh, you become promiscuous and no one partner can satisfy you. That's why God made uh, uh, intimacy between a man, a, mar uh, uh, a husband and the wife. Amen. Some of us, we opened up a door when we were young. We became promiscuous. Amen. And then we had multiple partners. God created marriage 
for a man and his wife, a husband and his wife. Does everybody understand that? Not for us to have different partners, amen. That's why some people, they go out here and they have multiple partners, then they finally get married and they can't be satisfied. Because they, they, they did an investigation, they became inquisitive and did some things that they should not have done. Are you here tonight? In other words, don't grow up too quickly. Enjoy yourself where you are in your station of life. There is nothing, amen, amen, but having to get up and go and, put, and, and, and punch in the clock when you have to. So if you don't have to, don't do it yet. Amen. Learn how to enjoy yourself and sleep in late, young people, because when you have to, you really have to. You can't afford to take a day off. You can't afford to lay low, to lay in a bed. Are you listening to what I'm saying? All right. Go to Isaiah chapter 26. There's nothing like having a support system where you can consistently encourage and build yourself up or have yourself built up. God has created such a system, and it's called the kingdom of God. Amen. If Satan can gain access and control of the mind, the work of God would be hindered tremendously. What Satan wants to do is he knows he can't stop the work, but he wants to hinder it. Everybody, the sound of my voice, whether you're in this building or whether you're on uh, Facebook or YouTube, God has an assignment for you. Say that God has an assignment for me. Put your hand on your heart. God has an assignment for me. Okay, my assignment is different from your assignment. Nevertheless, everybody at the sound of my voice has an assignment. You're not by here by accident, amen. You're not here just happenstance. God has designated and mandated for you to be here for such a time as this. And so uh, uh, to combat Satan and his, resent and his relentless mental attacks, our minds must go a psychological reformation. That means a tremendous radical change. Listen to what I'm saying. In order to combat Satan, because he's hitting us microsecond, every microsecond, I mean, every second, every microsecond, every tenth of a second with ideas, with issues, with all kinds of stuff that's going through our mind continuously. And one of the things we got to do is we got to learn how to cast that stuff down. Young people stay away from drugs. Prescription, illegal drugs, stay away from them. Why is this important? Because guess what? We're going to get to my favorite scripture here in a minute, but this is what I want you to understand. Drugs, alcohol, cause you to open up a window into your imagination. And some of the experiences are not good. Some people have taken drugs for the first time and lost their mind. Some of the people that you joke on and you look at walking up and down the street talking to themselves, that in most cases, they haven't had a mental breakdown. In most cases, it's because they took a bad hit of something. And now they don't know what time of day it is. They don't know what their name is. Only thing they look, they're looking for is, I need to get that next high. One of the things I learned about crack, and thank God, not through experience, just to listen to people who talk to crack, I mean, who took crack, they said the first time is so euphoric that every time you smoke crack after that, you're trying to get that original high, which, by the way, you never achieve. The saying in the crack world is one time is too many and a thousand times is not enough because you never reach that first initial euphoric high. Amen? And so in Isaiah 26, he said, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. See, the kingdom of God is such that, that we're not supposed to be on our own. Our trust is supposed to be in God. Amen. Some of us are going through things because we're trying to do it ourselves when we can't do it ourselves. Because if we could do it ourselves, amen, watch this, we wouldn't need God. But because we need God, amen, our dependency should be on him. So irregardless of whatever I go through, since I meditate on him, since I'm focused on him, since I'm in his word, I'm at peace. I've been through tremendous things in my life, amen, some of the most difficult times in my life. And then I finally caught the revelation that God is right there in the midst of with me no matter what I'm going through. And it gives me an overwhelming peace. 
no matter what I'm going through. I, and guess what? And because I meditate on him, yes, it's excruciating. Yes, it's painful. But in the end, God brings me out. And I'm better. Amen. And I'm stronger and I'm more mature. And then I'm apt to not make the same mistakes because my mind is on God and he gives me that perfect peace which surpasses all understanding. Because some of the things that we get in, let's truth be the truth, if I had to tell you the truth, it's so bad that you feel like you're going to lose your mind. And there are times, amen, when you're in your worst moment, you said, God, if you would only help me. And in that moment, you can feel his presence. In that moment, you know that I, I, I know it's bad. I, I know I, don't, I can't comprehend it. I don't know why this person is treating me this way, amen. I don't know why they hurt me. I don't know why they betrayed me, amen. But I know that God got me, and God will bring you out of it. He will bring you out of it. But your mind has to be on him. That's where you experience the peace. Your peace is not in another individual. They may help you, they may support you, but there's going to become a time that's just going to be you and God. Just you and God. Don't lose your focus. You and God. And in those times, sometimes God will allow things to happen in our lives so he can get the record straight. I'm the one that got you in this situation. I'm the one that blessed you. Amen. And now you putting all your, your eggs in a handbasket as if this person is going to be there for you. As if this person, they're not God. I'm God. I'm God. And so sometimes he has to, amen, allow things to happen so we get the right perspective. So we understand, amen, I prayed to get to this way, and so now that I'm at this level, I can't become satisfied. I got to pray harder. I got to stay harder. I got to study harder. I got to fast harder, amen. My focus must be on God. Think about it for a moment. How did you get there? Can we just be real? How did you get that job? How did you get that house? How did you drive that car that you used to and couldn't afford God. And so now when things got, start going south, you start looking toward the person that God gave you. Sometimes our problem is we take our sights off of him and put our sights on the individual. We take our sights off of him and put our sights on our job as if our job, amen, is going to be the situation that's going to bring us out. Truth be told, your job can't deliver you. Your job can provide a means of income. Amen. But let me tell you something. The things that we're dealing with right now, it's going to take God. It's going to take almighty God. Amen? But if your faith, see, see, ask your neighbor, check your faith. Where's your faith at? Check your faith. Amen? And, and know, why we get, know why we have trials and tribulations? God is telling you, check your faith. Where's your faith at? Where's your faith at? And then sometimes we go through these things, we find out my faith ain't what I thought it was. I was just shooting off scriptures and acting like, acting like I was a spiritual giant. And it took something in my life to knock me to my knees. To be told, that's where some of us need to be at, and on our knees, where we can look up to God and give God the glory. Can I, can I get an amen? So the objective of this teaching Fortifying your mind is a systematic process of ensuring that Satan is rendered powerless in our lives. We don't want to give Satan no access. Okay, I was doing a study today on Satan, and um, I've already told you before, Satan is not omniscient, Satan is not omnipresent, and he's not omnipotent. A lot of times we said the devil is trying to do this when in actuality it's not the devil, it's the devil's system. See, we're not big enough for Satan to have to come here to Huntsville to mess with us. So he has different demons, different spirits. He has different things, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life, to come to entice us to get out of God's will. Those are some of his tools that he used. So one of the things that, that, that we need to understand is I need to make sure that I have the proper perspective of life. When the problem is there's no balance for some of us. We're off balance. See, God came to balance us. 
That's why the only way that we can reach God is our horizontal relationship must be correct. Amen. Amen. It doesn't mean that I have to kiss, you know, you know, kiss your toes and things of this nature, but I should be in such a position that I don't allow you to get in my space, my spiritual space, so that my vertical relationship with God is off kilter. That's why I can't walk around here in unforgiveness. When I'm walking in unforgiveness, I'm off balance. So I need to balance this thing out, amen, because what's most important is my vertical relationship with him. That's why husbands, we got to be, we got to make sure that we stay on our game. Because in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, it talks about the man and, 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 and how, uh, uh, you know, a uh, uh, man must treat, you know, he must treat his wife as, uh, as a vessel of, uh, uh, as a weaker vessel. And he must make sure, I'm just paraphrasing, he must make sure he treat her properly. That Why? That his prayers be not hindered. Amen. We can't treat our wives any kind of way. Okay? We got to make sure, men, that we are the spiritual leaders of our household. We got to make sure that we're the ones. They don't want to pray, you pray. They don't want to study, you study. They don't want to fast, you fast. Because watch this. When you have the right perspective, God will turn your situation around. Many times he will not turn it around because if he turn it around, see, sometimes we have to go to trials and tribulation. They even say, it was good that I was afflicted. Good that I was afflicted. Why? Because now my mind is on God and not the situation, not the person, not the individual. Now my mind is back on God. Amen. And that's one of the things. That's how you fortify your mind. That's how you strengthen your mind. Not going to tell you that it's not going to hurt, but it shouldn't kill you. It may feel like it's hurting, going to kill you, but guess what? It won't. I promise you it won't. I can tell you some stuff. It won't. And it's going to work out for your best. And you're going to come out to such a level that the person that did it to you going to look at you and like, oh, my God. Look at what I blew up. Look at what I messed up. That's why if you're in a situation and you have a loving husband and a loving wife, you better thank God for them. You better thank God for them. You better thank, let me help you out. The grass, not only is it not greener on the other side, it's astral turf. But you don't know that until you jump on, oh, my God, this is not even real grass. It's actual turf. In many cases, you may not be able to jump back, so you better keep your happy self where you're at. Amen. Amen. Amen? All right, let's go deeper. Now, Satan is subtle and extremely deceptive. He's subtle. He's not going to come to us and talk about, I'm the devil. He's going to bring somebody to you that you don't even know that the devil has sent them and they are emissary of his. Highly deceptive. His ways. You got to understand, we, apart from God, we cannot combat Satan. We need the Holy Ghost. You got to realize, not only has he been on the earth for over 6,000 years, he was here before the earth was here. He's an ancient angel. Angel. He know all the tricks. He know everything that he knows to bring us down. That's why you better stay in the ark of safety. Okay? Let's define the word fortify. Fortify means to make strong, to strengthen, and secure. <coughs> um, to give physical strength, courage, or endurance to. To add mental or moral strength to. So when I said fortify, we got to fortify our minds. Now, watch this. The battleground is on three fronts, spirit, soul, and body. He fights us on three fronts. But it's through the mind that he comes as his primary target. Okay? The Bible said that in Proverbs that we are to guard our hearts because out of it flows the issues of life. 
Many of us got into trouble when we were young because we got into a relationship with somebody. At the time, we didn't know it. They warned us, but we had to have it anyway. And it messed with our hearts and in turn messed with our minds. I got two amen. I got one amen and one yeah. So I guess the rest of y'all, y'all exempt. Y'all didn't went through that. Okay? Y'all skipped that class. Amen. But I ain't crazy. I know you went to the class. I, you went to the class now. It's called a class of, of, of hard, knocks, hard knocks. When you gave your heart to somebody you shouldn't have gave it to. And when they got what they want, they left you high and dry. And then you went through that little emotional uh, roller coaster that you went through because you was in love with them, but you didn't realize they weren't in love with you. They were just telling you what they wanted you to hear so they could get what they got. And when they got what they got, they flew the coop. That's why young people guard your heart. Let me tell y'all something. Can I help you out from a, from, a, from a spiritual father perspective? You don't know nothing about love. What you feel is emotion. What you feel is the change of season in your body, young people. That's all you feeling right now. You don't know nothing about love, amen. So when somebody come to you, your age, they tell you they love you, remember pastor told you, and just think to your mind, you got to tell them, look at them, and in your mind you say, you don't know nothing about no love. Yeah, you write the notes. Yeah, you know you do this, and yeah, you do that. But at the end of the day, you don't know nothing about no love. Do you understand that? Because love, will stick with you no matter what. When you ain't got nothing, you look up, there go love. When ain't nobody hanging out with you, there go love. When everybody turn their back on you, there go love. Amen? When you unemployed, there go love. When you about to be homeless, there go love. And let me help you out. Very few people have the intestinal fortitude to walk with you that length of time. I'm just going to keep it real. And especially in this generation, this generation has no stand power. Fortifying your mind implies that we must do everything to thwart Satan's plan to protect him, building and strengthening our minds. Spiritual warfare and battles, uh, I already told you that, it, it involves battlegrounds on three fronts. On three fronts, your spirit, your soul, and your body. The primary attack point where Satan seeks to influence is the mind. Amen. If he can control your mind, the rest of your body will follow. If he can control your mind, amen, that's why people struggle with depression. Because they did something and they was young and a window of, was opened up into that depressive state. And then they seek out the people that can affirm them. And when they can't find somebody to affirm them, they go into a state of depression. I'm trying to help you. Some of you are right now, even where you at, I'm trying to balance you out. I'm trying to balance you out. There are some situations we're going through only God can correct. Give the individual and give the situation to God and you move on and make sure that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. What I mean by that? I mean, if, if you're in a situation and things are not going the way you're going, truth be told, you can't change the situation or the person. How about you say, okay, God, I'm giving it to you and I'm going with you. I'm going to let you handle this situation. I'm going to let you handle the person, God. But in the meantime, I'm going all the way in. Some of us, we one foot in and one foot out. Hoping, praying, God, God. Yeah, but you more in the world trying to chase this person than you are in God. How about get all the way in God, give that individual, give that situation to God, let God take care of it. Because let me tell you something, ain't no, ain't no whipping like the one God can give you. Ain't no whipping like the one that God can give them. God will close off everything. He will tear up their car. He will cause them to lose the job. Amen. He will bring them to a point in place. Oh, that's who you are, God. Job said, I've heard of you. Now I know you. What? Job worshiped. He loved God before he got into a jail. But it wasn't to what he went through that he knew God for himself. Some of us, we need to know God for ourselves. Not by what I heard, not by what I read. We need to know God through personal experience. 
personal experience. How do you know God by personal experience going through? When nobody wants to hear what you got to say because they've been hearing the same thing over and over again. There's something about going through. It brings you to a point place when it's just God and you. And sometimes God says, okay, I've been waiting on you. What you going to do now? What you going to do now? Some of, some, some of y'all in a position right now, you're trying to figure out what I'm going to do. God saying, yeah, what you going to do? You know why he asks you what you going to do? Because he knows you can't handle it. You can't solve it. Amen. So he's saying, what you going to do now? And that's when you fortify your mind and you go right back to Isaiah 26. Don't, write, don't go back there. Uh-uh. Stay here. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he loved thee, he trusts. When your trust is in God and not in things and not in people, there's peace that come to your mind. That scripture right there brought me through some tumultuous times. Okay, I got I to gotta go. I got to go fast. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's go there. Are y'all Okay. I hope this is helping somebody. That's why I'm on this series about the mind. Amen? You should know this scripture by heart now. <clears throat> for we walk not, for, we, for though we walk in the flesh, verse 3, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Okay? Here's the picture. Listen to this quote. The Christian, the Christian wearing his spiritual honor, armor and bearing his spiritual weapons set out to conquer the world for Christ, but he soon finds obstacles. You remember when we first got saved? The enemy has erected strongly fortified garrisons to resist the truth and prevent God's plan of redemption. There's the fortress of human reasoning reinforced with many subtle arguments and pretense of logic. There is a cattle, castle of passion with flaming battlegrounds defended by lust, pleasure, and greed. And there is a pinnacle of pride in which the human heart sits enthroned and revels in thoughts of his own excellence and sufficiency. That's a stronghold. It's our pride. It's our arrogance. It's, it's, it's when we get into a situation, I'm saved. God knows my heart. It don't matter that I got a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend on the side and I'm married. God knows my heart. That's a stronghold. Because you believe, you believe in deceit. You're born into a lie, and you think you are comfortable. And some people are in church living this way, and they think they got it made. Not knowing that what you've done. And let me tell you something what you do when you do this. When you get into this thing right here, this called this. That's why he said casting down strong. He said strongholds. When you get into a stronghold situation, what you do is you allow Satan to come into your life and wreak havoc. And what you do is you cause God's hedge of protection to be invaded. God wants to protect you. And strengthen you, but when you want to compromise his word, when you want to live a double lifestyle as a double agent, you have literally caused your hedge of protection to develop spiritual holes so Satan can seep in. And it's a thought process. Because and, and, and let me tell you something. Some of us. Our minds are so, our minds and our opinions are so lofty, can't nobody tell us nothing. Why do you think in the book of Luke, when the rich man said, okay, he said, well, Father Abraham, he said, send somebody to my brothers from the dead. 
and they'll be saved. He said, he said they have Moses and their prophets. He said, he said they won't listen to Moses. He said that nobody, them, he said neither will they believe somebody do they come from the dead. They, they had a stronghold in their mind. <coughs> Are y'all getting this? That's why you got to be careful having such a high opinion of yourself and thinking that you know everything. Because what you're doing is you have a stronghold. And guess what? Until you repent and humble yourself, God can't even penetrate the stronghold. That's why he said you cast it down. <clears throat> okay? Now, let's deal with this imagination. Imagination is the ability to form a mental image of something that is not present or to the scenes, to the senses, or never fully wholly perceived in reality. That's why you can't just let your mind wonder. You can't just like, you got some religions, they want you, they want to uh, achieve total euphoria. And one of the things they do is they'll meditate to such a point that their mind is empty. And that's their point of reaching total euphoria. Well, when your mind is empty and you don't have God, then your mind will be invaded by demons. That's why you got to be careful with imagination. Remember now, imagination is something that you dreamed up that's not present to the senses and in many cases may not even be true. He loves me. No, he don't love you. He don't even know you. Y'all heard that song years ago, Just My Imagination? Running away with me. And in parts of the song, guess what he says? She don't even know my name. It's just my imagination running away with me. That was a hit song. And what it is, some of our imaginations are running away with us. Amen. And we believe it. Notice what he said. He said, you cast it down. And then he said, every high thing, your opinion, your knowledge, all these other things that we have erected to such an point, instead of us worshiping God, we bow down to it. I bow down to my degree. I bow down to my sorority. I bow down to what college I went to. I bow down to my job. It's, a, it's something we have erected. That's why some people can't come to church because they are bowing down to their jobs. It's a lofty thing that we have erected. He said, you bring it. Then he said, you bring it into captivity. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. Christ is pulling on us. The Holy Ghost is pulling on us. But because we have a stronghold, we refuse to listen. Are you listening? This is good stuff. Can I give you an example? All right, go to Numbers chapter 30. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you an example of how dangerous imagination is. Anybody get anything? Okay. This is good. I was excited when as I was studying. I said, this is going to be good. It's 7.08. I'm trying to make the time stop, and I'm on page three. Lord, help me. Okay, Numbers chapter 13, are you there? Verse 32. <clears throat> and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, the land through which we have gone to search it, it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which were some of the, which, were, which, which, which come of the giants. And watch this. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Let me paint this picture for you. In the beginning of this chapter, God sends, he tells Moses, choose 12 spies. I want you to go into the land. And I want you to bring back a report. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. I've already given it to you. Past tense. 
He sends the 12 spies into the land. They are there for 40 days. In fact, they even bring some of the produce with them. One, one cluster of grapes was so big, they had to carry it with two men on a stick. That's how giant the grapes were. That's how big it was. Two of the individuals had a biblical perspective. This was Joshua and Caleb. The other 10 had a demonic perspective. Rather than trust God, they trusted what their eyes told them. Yes, there were giants in the land. Yes, they, they, the land ate up their inhabitants. But God is bigger than any giant. And he had already told them, I've given you the land. They came back, watch this, tell you how dangerous. Ten individuals came back with a bad report, and their bad report caused over a million five people to die over the next 40 years because they brought back a bad report because rather than trust God, they trusted what they could see. And even they said to themselves, and we were grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Who told you that? My mind. God didn't say that. They had already seen God's miracles. They, had, they were there when God, amen, did the tearing miracles in Egypt. They were there when God parted the Red Sea. They were there when God, uh, when Moses hit the rock the first time, amen, and water came out of the rock. They were there when God caused quail to come. They were there when God gave them manna from heaven. And still they didn't trust God. They trusted what they saw. That's why he said, be careful. He said, what you see is subject to change. Yes, you are going through some things. We are going through some things. But it's subject to change. That's why we're not to focus on what we see. Don't focus on what you hear. Focus on what God said. If God say you're anointed, I'm anointed. If God say you wealthy, I'm wealthy. If God say you're going to finish that degree, I'm going to finish that degree. If God say he's going to take you to your wealthy place, he's going to take you to your wealthy place. I'm going to trust God. I'm not going to trust my eyes. I'm not going to trust my ears. I'm not going to trust what other people say. I'm going to trust God. That's how you fortify your mind. <clears throat> what you see is subject to change. Some of us have been in some situations. We didn't know how it was going to come out. We looked up. We was out of it. We looked up. We was out of the situation. Why? Because it was only temporary. And God brought us out. God showed up mighty on our behalf. Why? Because we trusted God. We focused on God. We didn't focus on our situation. And guess what? Now, now, now this is the thing. You got to be careful. God will allow it, the situation. He will use Satan in the situation. See, Satan always takes it to the next level. That's why God, when it came to Job, he had to give Satan boundaries. He said, you can take everything he got. He came back. You can touch his body, but you can't take his, take his life. Because Satan wanted to take his life. So he had to give Satan boundaries. So even though God permitted it, Satan still has boundaries. Understand this. You got to say this to yourself. Okay, yeah, I'm in this situation, Satan, but you got boundaries. And I know that you can't go outside of God's boundaries. Okay, I'm good now. Now, this is the key. He bring it to you. I'm talking about Satan to pull you out of God. God allow it to show you where you at so you can become a better strengthened. The problem is we're so focused on the situation, we lose sight of God. You can't lose sight of God. You got to say what God says. Person want to cut up and act a fool, let him cut up and act a fool. Don't you cut up and act a fool. You stay on the wall. Remember Nehemiah? 
Tobias and him wanted him to come off the wall. He said, I will not come off the wall because I'm doing a good work. They wanted to pull him off the wall, to get him somewhere, and to assassinate him. He said, I will not come off the wall. And we got a purpose in our heart. I will not come off the wall. I will not abandon God. I will not abandon my calling. Amen. Let me tell you something. You will get yourself in trouble with God. Abandon your calling. Don't get caught up because you got a, a, a few dollars in your pocket or God has elevated you. It's connected to your calling. Abandon the calling, you're going to see some stuff begin to dry up. It's connected to your calling. What do you mean it's connected to my calling? God is allowing it because you called by him. And because you called by him, he's allowing whatever you put your hands to to flourish. Because of him, not because of you, not because of your degree, not because of your intelligence, because of him. Jesus is coming through Jerusalem, and the, and the scribes and the Pharisees, he said, don't you hear what they're saying? He said, make them stop. He said, I'll make them stop. He said, he'll cause the rocks to cry out. In other words, somebody got to praise me. And if they stop, the rock's going to cry out. I'm not going to let a rock cry out on my behalf. I'm not going to let a rock pull me out of God. I'm going to praise him. I'm going to exalt him. I'm going to magnify his name. I don't care what my situation is. I don't care how it looks. Satan, you are a liar. God's going to bring me out of this thing. That's how you fortify your mind. Don't you let a situation pull you out of God. Don't you let a person pull you out of God. I don't care what they meant to you. I don't care what they mean to you. God is more important. That's how you got to fortify your mind. I was telling y'all Sunday, and, and so, y'all got to understand some things. When I'm preaching and teaching, I'm preaching and teaching to myself too. See, y'all only get firsthand stuff. I get it when I'm preparing it, and then I got to get it again when I'm getting it. So when I said one of the things that bothered me is a weak man, I'm talking to myself too because there are times where I got to be undergirded, and I've got to be strengthened. Because let me tell you something, ladies. Men go through stuff that is unimaginable because we are men, and we are number one on the devil's hit list. Not you, the man. I can give you verse in Scripture. That's why in Egypt, Pharaoh said, kill all the male child. I can back you up. It don't go but just because he wanted to kill the male children. I can take you back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when God told a man, Satan, that the seed of the woman is going to bruise your heel. That is a male child. And we've been on the hit list ever since. That's why the enemy comes and he, he messes with our minds and he messes with our intestinal fortitude. And then now he's, he's entering into this generation where he's messing with their sexuality to the point they don't know they want to be a man or they want to be something else. Why? And if he is successful, whole generations will be wiped out. This is bigger than just what we see in our eyes. This is spiritual. That's why we got to stand your ground. We can't afford to compromise. We cannot afford to compromise. That's why it's important men and, and, and women of God that we get in our place and we fight and we fight for our marriage and we fight for our children, amen, because you don't understand there's generations down the line that's going to be born and, and, and things they're going to walk through is because, and godly things that they're going to be able to walk through in the hand of God is going to be on future generations because you didn't compromise in this generation. Some of us won't be here, but they said my great-great-grandfather was a preacher. He preached that word. He didn't compromise. And because he didn't compromise, amen, I'm not going through some of the things that I went through. He broke, he, amen, God used him and God broke gen and, 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 and uh, uh, destroyed generational curses in his life. Amen. There are some things that you know that's in your bloodline that you need to cast them down. And you ask God, it will not grow in my kids. It will not grow in my kids' kids. Not this time, devil. Not this time, devil. Diabetes will stop here. It will not move forward. Poverty stops here. It will not move forward. People dropping out of high school and living in the project. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with the projects. I grew up in the projects. 
but you ain't supposed to stay. Is it all right? You ain't supposed to stay. It stops, the buck stops here. But if you wimp out, I don't care what your situation is, it can't change. You want your situation to change? I'm serious, you want your situation to change? Then change it. Stay with God. Don't be in and out, in and out, in and out. Stop playing hopscotch with God. Stay in. Say, God, it don't look good, but I'm going to stay with you. I'm staying with you, God. God, I'm not going to compromise. God, I don't, know, I don't care how my finances is, I'm not going to get a sugar daddy or a sugar mama because you got some women that will pay men's bills and, and allow them to be on the Xbox. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Times have changed. I'm not going to compromise. I don't care if I ain't, I don't care if I am, am eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Amen. Find a different way to fix peanut butter and jelly. You can eat bologna different ways. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm just trying to tell you because I've been there. See, I can't tell you this stuff as I ain't been there. Now, I can't tell you about having no baby. I don't know about having no baby. I don't want to have no baby. I'm a man. <laughs> Sometimes a headache fold me up. You talk about, oh, it's coming. Oh, well, keep it. <laughs> we got to have a resolve in this day and age. I don't care what they think about me. That's not being arrogant. It's having a resolve and a resiliency that I'm going to live for God. You got to know that you know that you know that you know. One of the things I love, and I know I'm dating myself, one of the things I loved about Roots is even in the end, as he laid down, Kunta Kente never brought him to the reality that he was a slave. He escaped. They caught him. They whipped him. He escaped. They caught him. They whipped him. Found they cut off part of his foot. He still would not accept the fact that I'm a slave. He knew he had come from Africa. He had come through royal lineage they made his body a slave, but they couldn't enslave his mind. They could not enslave his mind. Twelve years a slave, a true story of a black man living up north, successful, one night got drunk and got sold into slavery by two of his comrades who were Caucasian. Twelve years he was a slave. In his body, but in his mind, he was never a slave. He fought for his freedom, and he finally got free. But some of us, we ain't going through what they went through. Some of us are. Some of us, what we're going through right now is excruciating. But even what you're going through now is not to take you out. God wants to take you somewhere. God wants to do something in your life. If you lay down and you throw in the towel, God ain't going to be able to do it. You got to look at the devil in the, in the eye and you tell him, just like when I took my grandmother passed away, I said, I'm going to do enemies to the, I'm going to do damage to the enemy's camp just for touching them. That's one of the things that motivate me. You understand what I'm saying? I have a resolve. I have a resolve that no matter what, I'm going to serve God. My job ain't going to keep me. Nothing's going to keep me like God's going to keep me. And until you have that resolve, you're going to live a life that's going to be a roller coaster. That's going to be a roller coaster. Amen? I'm getting ready to close. Where I want to close at? Okay. All right. Go to James 4, and we get ready to close. <clears throat> you have to have a resolve. Young people, do not be afraid to be different. What I mean by that, go to school, get the best grades. 
Don't look at people when they call you nerds, when they call you this, when they call you that. Get the very best grades possible. Be different. And so in James chapter 4, verse 6, watch this. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he said, resist the proud, verses 4 and 6. But he giveth grace unto the humble. What that word grace mean? See, we, we know grace to mean unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor. But there's a level of grace that gives us a resolve that no matter what, we have the supernatural ability to go on when others would give up. We have the supernatural ability to overcome when others would throw in the towels. That means he's giving us grace. But how does he give you grace? When you humble yourself. God resisted the proud. In another translation, it said he fights against the proud. He literally resists you. And you know that when God resists you, you're not going to win. So what we do is we humble ourselves, and he, he gives us grace to go through it. He gives us grace to overcome. Am, am I helping anybody out? Okay, let's go deeper. I'm almost there. Submit yourselves, therefore, to who? Submit yourself to who? It didn't say your job. It didn't say your degree. Didn't say your, uh, 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 your sorority. Didn't say to your kids. He said, submit yourself to God. Resist the do. Resist him. That don't mean you should have been having this conversation. You just said, but look, just, gonna, just, just get. As Martin said, get the stepping. <laughs> Sometimes we got to tell it up. Let's get the stepping. You don't allow him to come in your household and take up a residence. Amen? Amen. If somebody come to your household and they got the wrong spirit, well, you know what? I know you were supposed to come. I know you were supposed to have dinner, but that was going to change your plans. You got the wrong spirit. You can't even allow spirits to come up in your house because they'll change your whole atmosphere. You resist the devil. Watch this. The devil comes in the form of other people. I just told you, we ain't important enough for him to come in here in Huntsville. He got to deal with what's going on in D.C. and other big plots. He, you know, he over here in, in Ukraine somewhere, and then he got to hitch a ride to get back. I'm serious. See, we created Satan as he's this big giant. He is not. He has an army of demon spirits that are all over. That's why he has a strict hierarchy of authority, demonic authority. But when you submit to God, not one demon can overcome you. Not one demon can overcome you. Okay? Let's go deeper. He said, resist the devil, and he will what? Flee. See, when you stand in your authority, I was talking to somebody yesterday, and I was telling him, I, I, said, yo, I, I, I said, your title has none. I said, your title doesn't. I said, demons recognize. I said, when you walking in your anointing, Demons recognize your supernatural ability. Notice when I say when you walk into your anointing, as you just walk around here wearing a title, they could care less. They know you just a title worshiper. You you a title, amen. You walk around and you got a big old bag you carry around. You go from church to church gathering titles. They could care less about that. But they they are nervous and scared when you walk in the anointing of your title. Not the title that makes you anointed. It's the anointing that God has placed on your life. That's why some of y'all are going through. You really think it's you. Really, it's the devil's after the anointing. If he can just get the anointing off of you. If he can get the anointing, then he stops the move of God in your life. He stops your influence. You won't be able to uh, influence future generations, amen. You won't be able to speak and represent the kingdom of God because you allow the devil to take the anointing that only God gave to you. Now, he can't use it, but he can take it. It does him no good. The only good that it gave him is you don't have it anymore. That's why he ain't worried about these churches and pastors walking around here, sleeping around with each other and doing all that. They ain't got no anointing. It's on Satan's shelf. That's why they ain't got no power. Are you listening to what I'm saying? 
You want to have the power. That's why titles don't move me. The anointing moves me. And I'm out of time. I'm out of time. Fortifying your mind. Amen. Pray that this message has been a blessing.